case, like, I would do this as well. I don't know if I uh, mentioned that when we talked about uh, phylogenies, but actually phylogenies can be based on anything. The, the reason why people use genetic uh, uh, characters is because they are easier to, to find it's the method is, but, uh, but you could use anything. But genetic characters are really so fast to gather nowadays, it's so, so much less work that people tend to use those, but you could use anything. Is that usually what's used? 99.9% .9 of the time it's genetic characters. But they, they, you wouldn't have to, but that's what it is. The other question, was it the same question? No, it's not the right question. Oh, now you are. You have a question? No. Oh, you were just packing your dog. Yeah. What's the your dog's name? I would bring my dog, but they are like me. <laughs> Actually, they are very sweet. One is very nice. Okay, problems with the PSC. Uh, what characters to use? And so that's where I'm going to address these things. So, a number of people are using genetic characters, as I was answering your question, and a big push that has uh, uh, provided a lot of very interesting insights is what is called uh, the barcode of life. And the barcode of life is that scientists around the world have decided that one gene tends to be conserved enough for it to be PCR amplified and sequenced easily, but it's variable enough to identify species. That works for the most part. I tend to be quite critical about the, this, uh, this uh, concept. And then once I was stuck in an airport in the middle of nowhere in Australia with the guy that came up with it, and he just brainwashed me for five hours. I, I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> but at the end, he somewhat convinced me. I mean, maybe it's because of the Vegemite. I don't know what the deal is. But at the end, I said, actually, maybe you have a point. And now I'm somewhat sold because it's true that it's kind of cool to be able to sequence a single gene and just have an idea. The advantage of sequencing a single gene is that you can compare thousands and thousands of data sets and start to form an opinion of how, how well it works. And, and so that's really nice because you can now be very critical but with data, and you can be praising the project, but with a lot of data. So, you know, instead of just chatting, you can actually look at the hard facts and say, okay, does it work or not? So the idea, this is just a slide that shows essentially that you're taking individuals, grinding them, extracting the DNA, doing the PCR, sequencing them. So you sequence the cytochrome oxidase 1, that's a gene that is in the mitochondrion, so it's very easy to sequence the mitochondrial gene. And it is <coughs> it actually works in the largest number of species in the world. So that's very convenient. And eventually this is kind of they should they that's why they call it a barcode. Each one of these bars is a letter, and so you have a barcode for each species. Now what level of divergence uh, makes a species that answers the question that I got earlier? And so, one of the things that is kind of nice is that you can look now at hundreds or thousands of sequences and say, okay, these ones are species that we have recognized for the last 100 years. What is the divergence that is found at this level? What is the divergence at the level of the genus, of the family and stuff? And so, to make a very short answer, the answer is between 2 and 3 percent. That's the short answer. So the short answer is, is it a new species? Why is it more than 2 percent? Sequence divergence means every 100 nucleotides there are two mutations, 2 percent. Or is it more or less? However, this needs to be modified because it depends on the species. And this depends on how people have been looking at them. For example, for whatever reason, a lot of people really like birds. And so people are extremely attuned 
to minute differences among birds because there are hundreds of thousands of birders everywhere in the world. And so because there are so many birders, we can identify very, very small differences among birds. And sure enough, on average, the CO1 divergence that separates bird species is lower than in other groups of, of uh, species. And so you need to refine a little bit what you are talking about. And in some species that have not diverged for a very long time, there are real species, but the CO1 is very, has very low variability. In some corals, there is no variability whatsoever. So that's why I didn't want to give a, a big sweeping answer without qualifying it. However, if I were if I had a gun in my head, I would say 2%. You need to distinguish between gene trees and species trees. That's a problem. We, I briefly mentioned it, I think, when I talked about phylogenetic trees. I just want to remind you that if you use some genes that are under selection, sometimes some trees uh, are found that are very robust, but they do not represent the species trees. This is species of fishes in this case, and this is the real distribution, the real tree is the big envelopes, but if you were to follow the different colors which represent different genes, the trees are slightly different depending on what is on the selection and what is not on the selection. So, uh, that's a problem. Now, in order to get out of that pitfall, the phylogenetic species concept now has been refined and said instead of a single gene, you should use a ton of genes, as many as you can, and then when you do the average of all the trees, then uh, you would get uh, the real phylogenetic species concept, the real species. You can do averages of hundreds of, of trees. Oh, I should have. There are some software that do that, they, they result in some cool pictures, I forgot to put that in the presentation. Uh, if anyone goes back to this presentation on the web, I'll make sure tonight to add right here a picture of what an average tree looks like. And it's kind of cool actually, visually it's very, very nice. I will put a little note. The phylogenetic species concept unlike the biological species concept, does not address the mechanism of why you have that. They don't really care about it, they just say, this is what the tree looks like and that's it. I want to remind you, in the biological species concept, it specifically said, the species cannot interbreed. That's the mechanism. Phylogenetic species concept, they just say, we have this entity, that's it. This is, okay. This brings an opening to a lot more species concepts. There are more than 50 species concepts, and people came up with so many of them. And sure enough, even Darwin, who was very interested in speciation, said, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. And so because of this endless form thing, there is an entire book that's called Endless Forms, it's actually a really good book. It's a, it's a, a compilation of articles uh, by scientists that talk about species concepts. You don't have to read it, but if you're into it, just uh, get it at the library and read it. It's actually a really good book. In this book, uh, there is a person that Kevin DeCaro's works on lizards, and he, he tries to summarize all the species concept and tries to come up with some rational families of species concept a little bit like as I presented here and, uh, and tries to understand what could be an all-encompassing species concept and after Kevin's paper came out another paper came out that is extremely obtuse by uh, this person Hausdorff and he, he claims that he has the absolute general species concept, the mother of all, and it's really great. And his species are groups of individuals that experience peaks of fitness. I mean, this is great, but unless you are an absolute nerd, you have no idea what that means. I don't know if you remember, now I need to, you need to go back to before the, the midterm, I think. 
or maybe not, I can't remember when we talked about it. But you remember that I had an animation where you would have those populations that move over those colored peaks and valleys and at some point they would end up at peaks of fitnesses. All those organisms that are at the peak of fitness, this is a sewer rights concept of, uh, of landscape fitness, then the ones that are at the top are a species. That's what the ultimate species concept is. I mean, you have to be a real nerd to understand even what that's supposed to mean. But that's what he claims. And strangely enough, no one has challenged it since 2011. So it's likely that ultimately that's what the species is. This is species concepts. Now we're going to talk about speciation. How do you make species in the first place? That's great. It's 10.58. We've got two minutes of break before we talk about species. Let's take a two-minute break. Two main ways of doing it. 
One is that you prevent fertilization before the gametes fuse. This is what is called pre-zygotic isolation. The zygote is the fused gametes. So pre-zygotic isolation, you are evolving mechanisms that prevent the fertilization in the first place. This may involve a change in location or timing of breeding or courtship, whatever it can be behavioral, it can be physiological, it can be a number of different things. Another alternative is you don't do any of that, but you are preventing the zygote either to develop or to be fertile. And this is what is called post-zygotic isolation. So post-zygotic isolation, the hybrid is inviolable or sterile, and so you are maintaining the purity of the species, if I may use those loaded words, by preventing reproduction to, not by re uh, uh, preventing reproduction to happen, but by preventing the result of that reproduction to have any fitness. The fitness is zero. Either the organism is dead or the organism does not have any offspring. So, there are four major types of speciation that I will be talking about. Again, people love to split, so in the literature I'm sure that you can find hundreds of them, but I will talk about the four of them, and even those four are not super clear in my mind. So if they're not in mind, I don't know how it could be in yours, but what I mean by that is that if the distinction that goes from one to the other is very tenuous, in my opinion. Allopatric speciation, peripatric speciation, parapatric speciation, sympatric speciation. You know me well enough to know that as soon as there is a list, I love those things for, for example. I love these things, I don't know why I really should get over it, but I kind of like it. It makes it very clean. So, uh, this is how it's represented. Very often, when species diverge, at some point they meet back. That's what is called secondary contact. The bottom line is the same everywhere. This means that the species get back into contact. I don't know why in this graph they bothered showing that, because they are exactly the same. But anyway, the species are going into secondary contact. It means they've been separated at some point in their life history, then they go back in there. So we are not going to talk about this, I mean, a little bit, but that's not my point about the difference between the other four. So let me go one second through those, very briefly now, and then one by one I will explain what they mean. In an allopatric situation, the, the organisms are physically or temporally separated, it's what Ernst Meyer calls the multidimensional system. They are separated, they diverge into different species, and that's it. Then eventually they can go into contact or not, but they diverge into different species separately. This is the most common, commonly understood, it's really easy, that's a, I will explain all this in detail later, but that's the most common one. The other one, the other extreme is here. This is the sympatric situation. In the sympatric situation, the organisms are together, either in time or space or both, and then they end up into two species. That's sympatric. What is in between is in between those two models. A peripatric situation is when some individuals migrate into a different place and they turn into a different species, which is essentially allopatric, but they are migrated elsewhere. That is right next to it. Or in a parapatric situation, they are not too far, it's the same, but not too far, but they are still in contact. So I will give examples of all of these things, and then it's going to make it better, and then uh, if you have more questions about it, then I need to clarify by all means. Again, there are four of them, allopatric, peripatric, parapatric, sympatric, and I'm going to go through each one of them separately. So first of all, Allopatric speciation, that's the one that is favored by Ernst Meyer, that's the easiest one to understand, that's the better known one. Allopatric speciation, John Ender, who is a professor at UC Santa Barbara, he works, he has worked on 
vision is mostly birds, bowerbirds, and guppies. If any of you have fish tanks at home, you may have heard of Anders guppies. That's where it's coming from. So John Anders said the phenomenon of disjunction, which means geographic separation of populations, or complete geographic isolation is of considerable interest because it is almost universally believed to be a fundamental requirement for speciation. It means that, in his opinion, you always need to have geographic separation, which is true for the most part. Uh, a good example of that, reproductive isolation, uh, is uh, Hawaiian Drosophila. Hawaiian Drosophila is a fruit fly. It diverged in different Hawaiian islands and it turned into different species, one in each of the different Hawaiian islands. These are the native fruit flies, not the ones that people brought in later. And one thing that is very, very cool with this system is that the Hawaiian islands are, is a, a chain of islands that has emerged from the ocean floor because of a, a hot spot. The most recent island is the big island of Hawaii. The hot spot is a little bit to the uh, east of it. But the islands have been moving ge in geological times towards the west. And if you make a phylogenetic tree of the endemic species of Drosophila on the Hawaiian Islands, the older species are found on the western part of the islands and the more recent ones on the eastern part because they speciate as the islands come up from the ground, from the ocean floor. So it's a clear example of allopatric speciation. They are in different islands, they are set, physically separated. And, uh, You are exactly right, and when I don't have a good answer to your question because it's a fair, fair answer, and when I say I'm confused, that's where my confusion comes from. It's, it's, a, it's a matter, when I give examples, you will see that it actually is a little bit different because it uh, deals with both time and space of the event. So the examples that I will give, I hope, will say, oh yeah, it is kind of different. In the big picture, in my opinion, there are only two types. Either you are sympathetic or you are allopathic. And the other ones are just flavors of the same thing. But if you really want to uh, split hair, then that's what you will be doing. But when I give examples, maybe you will say, well, I, I kind of understand it's a little bit different. I'm not fully really convinced myself, so I cannot really um, give you a proper answer to your question that is very fair. Uh, a classic example, the poster child of allopatric speciation, is our beloved Darwin finches. Uh, and in this case, they also do adaptive radiations, where not only they, they go in different islands and they turn to different species, but then within each island, they turn into different, um, they have different ecologies. And so this is a classic drawing, you've seen it a hundred times, I'm sure, of, of uh, Galapagos finches, where the beak is modified depending on what they're doing on the different islands. What I'm talking about here in this context of speciation is the fact that they went to the different islands and they diverged into different species, genetically different species. There is a number of examples of that in birds, many examples. Another good example is the Hawaiian honey creepers. The, a lot of them are extinct now because people have introduced diseases and, uh, and uh, invasive species. But before, before people were on the islands, that's what it used to look like. A lot of different beautiful honey creepers. Uh, there is a lot of examples, but I just need to show a few. The Madagascar bangas, that's always the same kind of things. It's really cool birds. They are very closely related and they look very, very different. In the marine environment, it's actually really rare because of, uh, of the reproductive biology of most marine organisms. But there is one classic example that is the example of the cone snails in the Cape Verde Islands. The Cape Verde Islands are just off 
uh, Western Africa, and in the intertitle and shallow subtitle, subtitle, you have clones names, and they diverge into a ton of different species depending on which island they are on. On terrestrial systems, you have the silver zones, which is one of the plants that I really love on Hawaii, and uh, they are in the high altitudes in Hawaii as well. So it, it works for all sorts of organisms. Okay, so I'm spending a lot of time on allopatric speciation because it's the most, be the better known one and the most the prevalent one. Allopatric speciation is the outcome of two things. And so there will be a question, this is what are the two things that allopatric speciation, what are the two requirements for allopatric speciation? You need isolation and divergence. So you first have, it's a two-step process. You first have isolation, and then you have divergence. Isolation uh, re results in the reduction of gene flow, and divergence is created by the, the things that we've talked about before, mutation, genetic drift, selection, that act differently on the different populations. So yeah, whatever mechanism, very long time, it would take a long time for mutation, but you have genetic drift, if you have small family of populations, you have selection, stuff like that. Isolation, the first step, may be created by two processes, either dispersal or by carriers. What is the difference? The difference is the following. In a situation of dispersal, you have a population of organisms which are represented by those blue dots here that are not too far, let's say on an island, then there's another island that is created, such as the Hawaiian Islands, or birds arrive on one of the Galapagos Islands. The other Galapagos Islands do not have any birds. And then, for whatever reason, there is a storm, there is a hurricane, whatever, that moves the organisms to another island. They colonize the new island, and after, the, the, the result is that the, the two islands now are colonized. And incidentally, I'm getting ahead of myself, but because there are few individuals that have moved, then there is genetic drift that is very strong because there is sorting that happens because of the population that is small. This is dispersal at the top. At the bottom, you have the other the situation where you have a population that is very large, and then there is a phenomenon that physically separates them. This can be the continental drift. You have uh, uh, organisms that are found in Africa and South America before the continental drift and then the continents are broken apart and then they separate, that is vicarious. Or you have a movement of a river, for example, you have a big forest such as the Amazon, and when the Amazon River was created, then species, populations on each side of the, of the river turn into different species, that is vicarious. Vicarious was discovered or proposed in the 1950s by a botanist, his name was Leon Poisard, who worked in Venezuela. He was French Italian, but he, lived, he worked in Venezuela. And he came up with, he realized that some plants that he was studying in South America were very similar but different than the ones in Africa. And so he said, this has to do with the continental drift that had just been discovered uh, just a few years before. And then he said, okay, that's, that's what happened. So he proposed by Kenneth. If you are interested in some sort of crazy life, you can read about, about his life. He was a very, very bizarre character. Uh, now I'm going to talk about, so, allopatric speciation, you have isolation first, then divergence. Now we're going to talk about peripatric, parapatric, and sympatric, the other three, uh, three modes. So peripatric is when a new niche is entered, and again, it's more of an ecological thing rather than a big geological time frame. That's my understanding of how different it is from allopatric speciation. The classic example of that, you may have seen documentaries. The last time I talked about it, someone said, oh, there is a great documentary about this. There is a population of lions that move away from the regular distribution of lines and moved into the Okavango Delta in Botswana, I believe, and they specialize into hunting in water, I mean in shallow water, 
as you see this, uh, this lion uh, hunting. And eventually they are starting to be genetically different than, than the regular lions, let's say. And so they're going to turn into a different species. So a peripatric speciation is when you have really a movement of organisms that is going somewhere and ecologically changing and turning into a different species. Now, how different it is from dispersal and isolation, it's not much, but it's some sort of a, the time and distance is less, kind of. Very bad speciation. Has anyone ever seen any movies about those lions in water and stuff? Oh, you guys are missing out, it's really cool. Parapatric speciation. Parapatric speciation is reproductive, reproductive isolation that occurs without complete geographic isolation. You know, we are moving more and more towards sympatric speciation. And so, uh, the best example of that, there are two examples that I'm going to give. The classic example that has started this entire thing was uh, discovered by Trevor Price on greenish warblers. This picture is Trevor Price next to a picture of a green, greenish warbler. The birds are actually very small, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. Trevor Price is a super interesting person. He works at uh, UC San Diego, and uh, he's uh, British, I think. And he decided to hitchhike to Nepal to get the best possible weed. And that was his goal. And as he was toned out of his mind when he was in the Himalayas, he started looking at warblers and realized that uh, there was funny stuff happening there. And he came up with the idea of what is called ring species. That's what we're talking about. So ring species, this is how it works. So this is India and this area in the middle is the Himalayas. So in the Himalayas, in the middle here, uh, you, it's a high mountain, obviously, and so you cannot have, the birds cannot live here. And he, he noticed that the birds that were here were all mating with each other, and they, could, they had a specific song. And then they, at the border here, they could kind of mate with these guys, but then these guys would have a different mating song. They came there was some sort of border, and then there was another one, and another one, and another one, and they were going all the way around. Now, what is interesting about it is that they actually, evolutionary speaking, started off here. On this side, I need to be here because there is a camera. So they start here, and this is the recordings of their songs. And they have a dialect here, and they move here, so this is a single species. And then they, they moved here, and then they changed their dialect, their songs, and, they, and, uh, and these guys can interbreed with these guys. These guys can interbreed with these guys. Same here, but then at the end, he tried to interbreed these guys with these guys, and he couldn't. There was a very, very strong uh, breeding barrier at the end. And so that's the way that they are moving around, and eventually they diverge so much that they cannot interbreed. So that was, that was a mode of speciation that you slowly have a gradation where you diverge more and more and eventually you reach complete sexual isolation. So the, the classic example of ring species is the greenish border. The second one is in California, which is really great. And it's another example of ring species and it's with this uh, Encetina uh, salamanders, you may have seen those things. If you lick them, you are uh, kind of uh, toxic in a pleasant way, a little bit like those balance laws. And uh, that's exactly the same idea. I would just say the same thing about, about those guys that I just said in the other one. And this is their actual distribution around the Central Valley of California. But if you were to uh, represent it uh, schematically, what it shows here is that you have interbreeding that is possible between adjacent morphs of species 
but then, and little by little, they sort of migrated and they diverged a little bit and they have those species that are in, in those little pockets and eventually they diverge so much that at the end, when the rain is getting close, they, are, they diverge so much that they cannot interbreed anymore. This is what the guys look like. And this is what parapatric speciation is. So again, it's some sort of a putting words, in, I mean putting definitions into things that could be called either allopatric or sympatric speciation, but this is a little bit, a little bit more definite. Sympatric speciation is simple to explain, but complicated to, to, to show. Uh, the simplest way of explaining is you have two groups, two populations that are in the same place and ultimately they turn into two different species. So uh, reproductive isolation involves this complete geographic overlap. For the most part, sympatric speciation is very, very difficult to show scientifically and a lot of examples that are given in the literature in my opinion are absolutely not sympathetic speciation but I will still talk about it because that's what is shown in the textbooks but uh, Coyne and Orr, there are two authors, they wrote a book of speciation and they gave five requirements for a scientist to convince their peer that uh, sympathetic speciation is occurring. First of all, obviously, there should be a sympathetic distribution. They, the organisms need to live in the same place. Then, the history of allopatry is unlikely because as much as we have the impression that they are living together, maybe in the old days before humans were present, they lived in totally different places, so they turned into two different allopatric species. Now they are together, and we have the impression that they evolved sympathetically, but they didn't. They must be monophyletic sister taxa. When you do the phylogeny of them, they need to be right next to each other in the phylogenetic tree. And the reason for it is because they diverge from each other. And so that's evidence that sympathetic speciation has occurred. There must be reproductive isolation. If they interbreed, they go back into a single species. And there must be prezygotic isolation, meaning they cannot mate. <clears throat> so in plants, this is actually not completely uncommon uh, because in plants, polyploidization is not uncommon, meaning that plants that <coughs> reproduce oftentimes change the number of chromosomes of the offspring. Uh, this is an example where you have a diploid parent that is mating with a tetraploid parent and eventually you end up with offspring that may not be able to breed back with the parents but can only interbreed with each other and eventually turn into specific species with different number of chromosomes. In plants, this is actually not uncommon and this is true, let's say, sympatric speciation. Sorry. Right? <laughs> now, no, it does, that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, so they turn into different species. And so that is genuine sympathetic speciation. It's kind of a quirk of the genetics of, uh, of plants. The most classic example of sympathetic speciation that I personally completely dislike is uh, the example of the soulberry bugs. The idea is that there are two, th so these animals, they, uh, they uh, feed on seeds and then they put their eggs inside the seeds of, uh, of those plants and there are plants that are right next to each other one of them has, incidentally has been introduced but that's not actually the worst thing that happened but one was introduced and one has a small seed, small uh, pod and the other one has a large one and uh, the insects need to have a different size proboscis to go inside the small or the large uh, seed. And so because of that, right next to each other, you have two plants right next to each other, and then the bugs that used to be a single species now turn into two species because a new plant was introduced. And that has a different size part. 
The reason why I don't like it because it's sympathetic is because if you have a drone or if you are very far and you look at it, yes, it is sympathetic. But in my opinion, this is completely allopathic because you never have the two bugs in the same plant. They are just in two plants that are right next to each other, granted. But as far as the bug is concerned, they live in two different worlds. I mean, okay, sure, they are like one meter away, but they could be a mile away, it would make no difference. However, this is the, the classic example of sympathetic speciation. So if someone asks you, is this sympathetic speciation, you really should say yes. But in my opinion, it really isn't. That's how it's presented. There are, however, good examples of real sympathetic speciation. One of the best ones is the case of palms on Lord Howe Island, which I think is a paper that we may be reading in class, or maybe it's at least on the, on the reading list. And the other case is uh, sympathetic speciation on Crater Lake cichlids in, uh, in Nicaragua. These are two papers that came back to back in uh, Nature, if I remember well. And uh, both of them presented very convincing evidence of sympathetic speciation. In the case of the uh, of the palms, the the idea is that it's a very small island, and there are palms there. And at some point, a mutation changed the timing of reproduction of some individuals, and so. They were all together, and then a mutation just changed something that instead of reproducing in this moment of the, the, the time, they reproduce at some other time, and eventually they're going to start mating only with each other. So they are isolated temporally, not geographically, but temporally, and then eventually they diverge into different species. So within a small island, there was a mutation that changed. One, uh, one of the, in, some individuals, and eventually they turn into two different species. So that's a really beautiful example, I think, of sympathetic speciation. In the case of uh, Nicaragua cichlids, they are in a very small, uh, in a small lake in Nicaragua, and I won't go into the details, but the individuals within the very small lake, one went up in the water column, is filter feeding, the other one is at the bottom, and benthic feeding, and uh, eventually their morphology started changing, they started reproducing only with each other, and there is a lot of genetics to back it up, so there is morphology, behavior, and genetics to show that it's within the very small lake uh, sympathetic speciation has occurred. Eventually, they need to separate those from each other. So, um, these are the four main modes of speciation. Allopatric and sympatric, I think, are relatively clear as far as conceptually. And then uh, peripatric and parapatric, you can make up your own mind as to what you think about, about if the definition is, seems fair or not. Uh, hmm. We've got four minutes, I mean, I will just start talking. I had a bunch of other things to talk about. I would just talk very briefly about a few things. We have talked about speciation, but what is driving speciation? Well, the first thing that is driving speciation is natural selection. And you may have a number of reasons why natural selection is happening, but that is the example of the adaptive radiations of uh, Darwin's finches, for example. Not only do you have isolation and divergence, but the divergence is due to natural selection. They go into different environments, and the different environments are going to shape their beaks in different ways. And eventually they turn in, they also accumulate uh, mutations that prevent them from uh, mating with each other. You can see that with the regular outlier loci thing. You remember that it's the graph where you see that you have genes under selection. We've talked a lot about outliers. So you can identify selection and selection can be identified with regions of the genome that have very high FST between populations. So not only you can say that uh, natural selection is likely to have driven speciation, but you can actually find the genomic regions that are involved in speciation. 
Section selection is likely to uh, make an import, play an important role in uh, speciation. Oh, I want to show you something. There is something that I really want to show you. Okay, this is fine. You have a bunch of ecological speciation. That's great. There is an example. Okay, this is, I'm going to talk about this because this is really important. Just very last point. When you want to have speciation to occur, one of the things that may be occurring is prezygotic isolation. How does this happen? Well, either you prevent the organisms from mating altogether, and this is because the genitals are going to be changed, the timing of reproduction is different, the pollen is incompatible with the pistil and stuff like that, or you can have a number of things that happen when the sperm is meeting the egg. And in invertebrates, particularly marine invertebrates, you have a number of genes that are involved in the recognition or in the attachment of the sperm at the surface of the egg. And uh, this is sperm binding proteins. Now, is it really true what I'm saying? If this were true, in species that recently diverged into different species, the number of mutations in sperm binding proteins should be very high because they should have diverged very, very quickly. And this has been indeed found. Vic back here, he's a professor at UC Davis, and he's done a lot of work on that. And Steve Palambi at Hopkins Marine Station worked also a lot on that. And he showed that there is a lot of selection happening on binding proteins. But there is an experiment that I want to show you that I think is really cool. It's this experiment. What they did is that they took uh, sea urchins, two species, and they uh, extract eggs and sperm. And what they do is that they have two species. One species is white and one is dark. And they take the egg of one species.